Hey, Taylor, it's Ian. Just catching up on the October OSR series, and it brought a smile to my face to hear you recounting the tale of the alchemist fire goblins. I've told that story since, but in hindsight, I thought I was playing a cleric. I didn't remember I was trying out the favored soul. Anyways, it was good to reminisce. Now I've, uh, I need to catch up on about a half dozen more episodes. Thank you, my man, for calling in. It's good to hear your voice. It's fun to know that we created a memory that's worth retelling. I'm sure that that story has inspired uh, other games <laughs> ever since. And uh, there you have it, listeners. Proof positive that at least one of my stories is true. Thank you, Ian, for calling in. Hey, Taylor. Jason here. Just want to say enjoyed your latest episode with your Alchemist Fire and... Yeah, I, I think both the players and the GM should be creative in what they're doing. I mean, the GM needs to be careful because the GM can obviously create death traps and things are unwinnable. But the fact that you let them use water in there shows that that's not what you're going after, right? I mean, definitely what's good for the gander or good for the goose is good for the gander. And if the players use certain tactics that are super effective against the monsters, then you have to expect the monsters to take notice of that and then either use those same tactics or use counter tactics against the players because word is going to get around about this deadly group of adventurers out there, right? So I, I don't think using the alchemist fire the way you did was wrong in any way, but I think the idea of letting water put it out was good because it, you know, it didn't make it just a super death trap for the players that, you know, they didn't have a chance at. So anyhow, great job. I appreciate that. And I will talk to you later. Plus, if anyone had called me on it, I figure they had used a divine spell, uh, create water, to do it. So it was it was uh, magic water after all. <laughs> but anyway, more more so the the thing about player ingenuity, you absolutely do. You want to keep the monsters reacting, monsters thinking, dynamic movements and changes in the environment to react. And that way you can keep the players thinking, keep the players adapting, because if they're just doing the same things over and over again, they're going to get bored. And who wants to get bored with the game? Uh, then now you, there are some ideas that you, you want to discourage. So the... Uh, for example, I had a player try to block a lightning bolt with a metal weapon before, and that did not go well for that player. And I just, I can't, that's just how it goes. <laughs> but then they, at the same time, when you have borderline ideas or when you have good, good ideas, good ideas are easy to encourage. But when you have those borderline ideas, find a way to make it fun. Find it, it, it can it work? Maybe they can roll a die for it. Maybe they can uh, elaborate on it. And while you don't want the game to descend into a fancy version of Mother May I, you, you don't want to punish player ingenuity because uh, like I mentioned when we were talking about mapping a little bit, I wanted to encourage players to map, so I rewarded, uh, not not rewarded, but I did not punish them for certain elements of mapping. So some referees will, when the player is, say, hit with a fireball, make them roll to save to see if their map is destroyed. Now that would be spooky. That would make you definitely dodge them fireballs. I will admit, I have not done that before. Uh, we did have our mapper hit one of his characters, because yeah, he was running a couple at, at the time in the dungeon. He he got killed because they went into this room, kind of they were outnumbered. Uh, they fell back, but his stuff was dropped in that room. And I thought about, should I have him turn his map over? And I ended up not asking him to do that, just because, like I said, I didn't want to discourage the activity. I don't know if I did right, wrong, or indifferent. We, we, they ended up going in and recovering the stuff eventually anyway. They figured out a way around. But yeah, the, to circle back, it's important to encourage player creativity. Reward the good ideas, punish the bad ideas, and make the ones that are somewhere in the middle interesting. Because that way you get that feedback loop. You recreate and you 
build the experience that we're talking about. So anyway, good call in. Thank you for thank you for making it. Fun topic to talk about. Taylor, Taylor Jeff. Just got through day eleven of your podcast of the OSR October. That's what I'm calling it. And uh, great point about reading the rules fresh. And that was one of the things that I think uh, Rob C and I did when we went to those deep dives. I learned that lesson because there were things in there. I'm like, wait a minute, I always thought this was in there, or I missed that rule. And we get so comfortable with things that we think we know it when we really don't. So it's you know, great advice. Everybody should go back and reread their rule systems you know, every so often. And you know, people go back and reread The Hobbit or you know, Stephen King thing. Why? Because they do it, but they forget little things here and there. Good show. Later. I should reread The Hobbit, come to think of it. It's been a while. Though, one thing I can say about finding new things in same old media, the biggest experience for finding new things on repeat watches for me is from everyone's favorite campaign tone ruiner, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Growing up, I watched that movie multiple times a year. I've got to have seen that movie over a hundred times, but every single time I watch it, there's been something new. There's just so much little stuff that's bundled up, packed into that movie that folks don't give it credit for how dense the humor is. Um, so thinking about the, for example, everyone's favorite, the Frenchman, the taunting Frenchman, Knigget's, it took me a decade, entirely longer than I want to admit, to get that that was a French mispronunciation of the word night. <laughs> I, it's, and it's based in real linguistics. Native speakers, the way that they enunciate particular phonemes leads them to read night uh, with the hard K in front of it. Which So that joke is, I don't know if they intended for it based on an academic study or if it was based on experience because being in, the, uh, being in England, you know, you're next to French people. So this may have been a joke for people who spoke English and knew Frenchmen. But it's, it's, it was there all along and it took me years to figure it out. Uh, on a less educated joke, there's a scene where Arthur is riding past Camelot and there's a peasant in the background that's smashing a pond with a, with a club. He's fishing. He doesn't have a fishing pole. They're too poor for that. So he's got a stick and he's trying to club the fish. It took me 20 years to figure out that joke. <laughs> Entirely too long. But I'm rambling. In the same sense, absolutely, it's important to reread the rulebook occasionally and to look at it with fresh eyes because there's stuff in there that you wouldn't expect and there's stuff that's not in there that a lot of folks, especially those of us like uh, you, most of my listeners, and I know Jeff and I included, we've played a lot of games, a lot of different editions of the same game, and a lot of it just kind of flows together. And um, it, uh, knowing that was in second gear instead of third, um, knowing that uh, the stuff this flows together, it uh, it's very easy to accidentally put stuff together. And the one I quoted, I think, was the attack of opportunity. That's something that's my pet personal did it wrong. <laughs> um, but yeah, tons of stuff like that. Uh, and then tons of little things that everybody else rules out that you just forget are in the rules to begin with, like BX, limiting the number of spells in your book to the number of spells you can cast. So it's uh, makes sense why you get rid of that one. Makes sense why you would change some of the others. But uh, anyway, food for thought. And while I am here... I do want to take a moment, I had promised this uh, at the start of an episode, and I, I'm throwing it here in the middle because I'm not reliable. Jeff had actually pointed out to me that in a previous episode, dear listeners, I may have conflated my Jeffs. There are two Jeffs in my life. Uh, I have Evil Jeff and Good Jeff. Evil Jeff, dear listener, who you have just heard, is a podcast host and part-time player. He's played in a couple games that I have run. We had fun there. Maybe we'll get to play again one of these days. But the important part is he uh, did a bit with Ray Otis talking about Appendix N. And then there's a second Jeff in my life, uh, Good Jeff, uh, who became Good Jeff after Evil Jeff self-identified as evil. But that's another story. Uh, Good Jeff is of Buddy Scott Entertainment. It's a drive through entity where he gives away free modules, games, and supplements. 
and uh, refuses to take any compensation for them because it's just sharing it for the love of the game and refusing to be beholden to the consumer as customer. And good Jeff uh, is a little younger than I am. And uh, during an episode, I talked about a Jeff being a little younger than I am. And Jeff, uh, evil Jeff, uh, very kindly uh, reached out to me. Uh, I had uh, I got some clay tablets that were delivered to me in the mail. They had some cuneiform notes on there, and Jeff was very polite, and he pointed out that, in fact, he is old. He is incredibly, incredibly old, and he, I, I apologized profusely and offered to put that correction on the air. So, hopefully, Jeff, uh, you've been able to chuck a slinky into a tree in a good reception area so this podcast is coming across uh, and coming out of those uh, Edison ho- holophones. And again, accept my apologies. I will, in the future, make a point to be more conscientious of the people in my life who share a moniker. So thank you, everybody, for your patience and apologies if uh, indeed I had uh, made a mistake. So, thank you for calling, Jeff. It's good. It's always good to hear your voice. Hey, Taylor. Jason here. Just want to say that I couldn't agree more with your latest episode, Read the Rules with a Clear Mind, the idea that, you know, forget other rule sets when you read the rules and take them at face value. That's so, so important, especially when you go back to OD&D or, or, or even, you know, AD&D, but you can't, you can, there's muddle between the the um, editions, right? And this is something that our friend MW over at the World's MW Lewis podcast has talked about, which is primarily AD&D, a little bit of BX podcast. But, you know, look at the sleep spell. In OD&D and AD&D, the sleep spell, you roll for all those categories. It's not up to a certain hit dice a monster's put to sleep. It's so many of this hit dice range, so many of this hit dice range, so many of this hit dice range. But we remember the verbiage up to this many hit dice from other editions, and we import it in. So you have to take each edition on its own. That's not saying you can't house rule it. To do it like a different edition does it. But to... but. We, we should understand what the game is doing on its own first before we try to modify it. So, great, great episode. Keep up the wonderful work. Take care of yourself, my friend. Or Burning Hands. So, in 3E and onwards, Burning Hands is like a flamethrower. You have this gout that comes out in front of you in an arc, where uh, in AD&D, that's measured in, like, in-game feet. So, you're, you're, you have to be right next to whatever you're torching. And for Burning Hands, that's actually kind of interesting because in 3E and onwards, it is implied that that's a combat spell. And I know in I've played BX where I think we've ported in a Labyrinth Lord version. I'm having some additional muddle between OSR games <laughs> in my head. But in, in a BX game I played, the Burning Hands spell operated in much the same context as a flamethrower. But because of the limited range and because it was an area of effect... You couldn't use it, so it because in BX you can't move and cast, and then in uh, in third edition where the flamethrower effect started, to my knowledge, you could move and cast certain spells, and that was one of them. So part of the ID, part of the game of Burning Hands in 3E was move into a place where you can use it, and then see if you can get out. And so it's there's a very tactical element to it. By comparison. When you're burning like a foot in front of your face, you have to th- is that actually a combat spell? Or are you using that more as a utility? Do you use that to ignite certain things on fire? Uh, is this a, oh no, they blew our torches out and we're in combat. Can I use burning hands to uh, immediately uh, relight something or uh, let me let me get us back into where we can see so you think about there were wooden doors maybe I burned my way through a wooden door but yeah I, I can go on but the nature of the spell is totally different between different editions of the game and the intended use is totally different so uh, where do I start um, I've just jotted down a whole bunch of different notes um, some of them are just going to be me saying, hey, I, I agree with you. Um, I guess I'll start with I, I too, uh, agree with the, the fun of, of creating game mechanics. I've been working on my own for multiple years now, and, and I hope to 
uh, finish it up. Um, I also agree that it's not the, the GM's job to um, make um, players have fun. I, I do think it is the Game Master's job to be a good host and provide a, a, a table and tabletop experience that people can enjoy, uh, but not, but not uh, his job to make them have fun, get into character, or, or any th anything like that. Very much so. That's one of the things that we kind of lost when we uh, started doing so much online gaming versus in person. Because when I, I try to be cordial to people just in general, and the uh, online people don't have that sort of uh, uh, hang up, I guess. Because, you know, when you're gaming with people in person, even if it's just out in the and the top of the trash can is broken off. Oh, uh, well. If the uh, if you're gaming in person, you're gaming with friends. You you have people. You can see them, and uh, you have to answer to them. Judah, stop whacking the car. The trash can has been confiscated, and we're going to be playing with a new toy now. So, where was I? So anyway, the when you have real people that you have to answer to, if you if they're in your own home, if they're in the comic shop or wherever, then you have faces. You you have an obligation. Whereas if you're online, it's just another username that you can block and never hear from again. And so that's something that we've lost a little bit, I think, in more recent vintage. When I was running games in person, um, uh, first first couple sessions, I would actually provide lunch. I ordered pizza or did a Papa Murphy's. Uh, for those of you outside my region of the country or outside my country, Papa Murphy's is a chain where they will put together a pizza for you but they don't bake it so you take it home and you bake it on your time so it, it uh, they had a lot of great fresh and, why, why am I talking about pizza uh, have I eaten today yes uh, anyway so I used to and I, I used to feed my players to, and uh, they actually started bringing stuff of their own so every game ended up being a potluck so and you know, you, again you can't really do that on um, online games though I'm sure that if I PayPal'd every player two bucks to pick up a beer uh, for the game, no one would turn it down. So anyway, I forgot where I was going with this story, but I do agree with you when you say it's the it's important to be a good pl friend. Be be a friend to your players, not an ally to your characters, because that will rob them of their victories. But just be a good dude, and good DM will typically follow. I struggle with wanting a gaming group that will play a bunch of different games versus a gaming group that will stay in one campaign uh, because I like to see the growth of a character, to connect with that character. And, and so, but I love creating new characters and, and, and trying new, new worlds and new systems. And um, I guess that's what I love about going to conventions um, where I can try games I've never had the chance to try and then want to play them for a long campaign and so uh, it's the struggle uh, that I have and maybe maybe that's why uh, the um, the solution people say is well then just game uh, sorry then just be a game master well you got the same problem I want to I want to run a bunch of different gaming systems so what's your answer to that it is something I struggle with so when I was in college, arguably the heyday of my RPG experience, I was playing a handful of times a week. Our group would alternate DMs, and each of us had our own distinct world, milieu. And usually the pattern would go in terms of uh, what we played. It would be a and d esque game. Then someone would bring in something different, so a traveler or a paranoia, something like that. One in particular friend that I'm thinking about either had a friend at Mongoose or was on the Mongoose uh, mailing list because he would bring a new thing that when, back when they were uh, bringing all those old IPs back to life in the 2000s. So yeah, he would bring a new one of those roughly every few weeks and we would usually give it a shot. Uh, but anyway, so the, the pattern tended to be d and esque thing non d and thing, d and esque thing, non d and esque thing. And one of my co-DMs, one of the fellows who, whose game I really enjoyed playing in, he intelligently wove each campaign together in a sort of continuous history. So 
his world started out a certain way, or I, I came to that world and it was a certain way. And uh, a couple friends who had played in it before told me a little bit of inkling about what some of the names meant, where some of the uh, cities had come from, that kind of deal. But I didn't think about it at the time until the second campaign rolled around and a character I had played who had survived into a uh, name level had a role. They, they had they had essentially faded into history, but they they had played a role in the game. And so the history we put together on the previous campaign was carried over and affected what the next campaign did. And so he had continued. I assume he's still doing this. I have not had a chance to play with him for... Whew. He played when I ran Fandelver. Uh, Fandelver came out. I ran that and decided 5e wasn't for me. Which, uh, so that's, it's been a while, so we haven't had a chance to play, but um, the distance, prox uh, proximity breeds players, but yeah, and we, and I moved, I moved away, but anyway, the important part, that is something I wanted to do, but I had no discipline to do. So I have a very bad habit of getting a good idea in my head and then creating a world, a society out of it, building a huge map, and then running a game and then forgetting about it. And so I've tried to amend that. I've been running the same campaign world. Uh, I say running, it's on and off because kid, young children will mess up your schedule. But uh, I've been running the same world on and off for a few years now and, build, and building back into that consistent milieu. I picked the one from my history that I enjoyed the most and decided to stick with it. And so I'm running the experiment now of having a ongoing campaign that world, but a whiner. A whiner? What's a whiner? Zach is a whiner. Oh, Zach is. I see. Um, but anyway, the. A whiner? But anyway, so that's something I'm going to try. So in terms of have I done it before? I'm not good at it. I enjoyed playing the multiple games, but I was unable to balance it with that campaign kind of uh, world, the evolutionary campaign world, but it's something I'm going to try because I know at least one buddy of mine has succeeded on that front. Hey Taylor, Jason here. Great episode on mapping. Maybe, and this might be something outside the OF, you've already got I think everything planned out, but it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on tips to the GM for mapping, right? So describing the rooms and all that and tips on describing because sometimes maps are a little bit more complicated than just you're in a square room 30 by 30 with a door on the east, west, and north wall. You, you know what I mean? So sometimes, so I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts on mapping from the GM's point of view to make it not super easy for the players, to make it doable for the players, especially for new mappers. We want to challenge them. We want them to, the people I know that enjoy mapping enjoy the challenge, and they do like to see the final GM map at the very end right? Okay, we're all done with that campaign. You're done with, you're not going back there. Here, let's see how close you were, that kind of thing. Or if you're going to go back there, of course, they don't get to see it. But but I know the players enjoy the challenge, but how do we as the GM help them do that in a way that doesn't frustrate them too much? So I think that'd be an interesting discussion. It absolutely would. Now, from the perspective of the ref, I know that, like you said, square rooms and hallways are typically easy. Um, for, so square room 30 by 30 hallways can be tricky because you're you have to deal with the the turns and where are the doors for me i tend to when the turn occurs say you have a t um i well i will start with an l so say you have a hallway heading ahead and then it curves north what i will usually describe it as is your so your hallway the hall ahead extends 30 feet before curving north, such that the north wall extends 20 feet while the south wall 30. So I'll say something like that, and uh, then that, that tells you exactly what to expect. And from a T perspective, you have, well, the corridor extends 30 feet before hitting a blank wall. However, in the final 10 feet, a cor a, the corridor T's going north and south. Again, you have a bit of a picture painted, and at, uh, you have a bit of a picture painted, you have a bit of a uh, player is able to map. Sorry, I'm in traffic right now. I'm just going to get behind this truck and then stay there. Um, there we go. 
So then, then think about the other thing that people have a hard time with is caves because caves are irregularly shaped. The advice I would give on caves when describing is don't be realistic. So we recognize, so try to describe it in polygons and then don't worry about the nooks and crannies. On your referees or DMs map, you're gonna have nooks and crannies, you're gonna have a bunch of weird stuff, but then just describe it as though it was a polygon. It's okay to say the cavern is roughly hemispheric with a radius of 40 feet. It's okay that it's not perfect, but it gives the party, it gives the mapper enough to work with that they can create a frame of reference. Some folks like to do point to point for caverns, and some folks do point to point for you know regular maps, but that I, I, I like to have the shapes kind of mapped out because it gives me a better perspective and a better, uh, if I'm running or if I'm trying to make my way back through somewhere, it's easier for me to have a uh, graph paper style. Um, let's see, the last thing I can think of on the coming through here is sometimes diagonals can be a challenge, especially if you're diagonal at a strange angle. So if I'm going northwest, then it's easy to say the hall goes true northwest for 40 feet. Because then, you know, you just kind of roll it. You go that way, and it's, it's a diagonal line on the paper. But if it's a shorter angle, then you have to describe kind of the run. And that can be a challenge if you don't have light. So if, if I'm going, if my hallway is 40 feet north to south, but then shifts so that it's 10 feet over, that's a very shallow uh, curve. That's a very shallow deviation from the cardinal direction. And can you tell that to the player because their light source only goes out 30 feet? Well, in that case, I kind of describe it to them as they go. Um, one of the tricks that I picked up, and I'll see if I can find the link because this isn't this isn't something I came up with for light, is you have your DM map. And being an analog ref, I have my DM map in front of me on the table behind the screen. Get an index card. Use a compass to trace out the amount of space that you would need to have a light source radius, and then plop that bad boy down. Cut it out, plop that bad boy down, and describe what is in the cutout in the index card. Much easier than trying to fake, trying to like fake it and cover it on the fly. No, so it's a very easy way to identify. Okay, this is what the party can see. So those are some a couple things that I've had issues with and trying to resolve in the past. But the biggest thing that you can do is be consistent. Whatever you do to describe rooms, describe them consistently. Uh, use the same adjectives. Use the same processes. I like to tell people when doing a room description, write a haiku. Get it. Uh, tell them the initial impression the basic dimensions, and then any extra at the end. Um, there's some cool things that other people have done that I've yet to do that try to help to reinforce how uh, players may role play. So, for example, I've heard elves. Elves are not naturally at home in the dungeons, so the first thing that you could always do is describe the exits and then the dimensions. Uh, then for, for halflings, you could describe the contents first and then work your way up. Dwarves, you could describe the dimensions first. And so there's that subtle way to uh, identify uh, and try to encourage role play. But the... Uh, I have not tried that. I would love to hear if someone had done that and how it worked out for them, because that just seems like a cool idea and a very, uh, a very, a very interesting, uh, a very interesting trick to try to play with. Um, but if, if if nothing else, be consistent because the the patterns that you develop, the rapport you develop with the mapper, is going to be the best way, the best thing you can do to to, to create that kind of 
symbiotic process. So they're going to ask questions. I, I respond to questions. I have heard of uh, more adversarial refs not responding to questions. Uh, you should have listened the first time. That doesn't seem fair to me, uh, especially because the character is in the room and they have a light source. Uh, tax them in turns if you're being if you feel like being a jerk to your players. But um, yeah, I answer questions. The questions get. Uh, because I want to encourage questions. I want to encourage players to, to get involved in that, that way. Uh, and then at the same time, you have the uh, the mapper will pick up on the, the way that you say things. So if you say things consistently, you answer questions consistently, you'll develop that kind of communication pattern with the mapper, with the party. And so over time, you're naturally going to create a much easier experience. And so that's that's my two cents. My biggest two cents is to be consistent and uh, for the benefit uh, of the mapper who's going to learn your ticks as you go along. And that wraps up another episode of the Clerics Wear Ringmail podcast, an independently operated product released for educational and informative purposes under the You Can Totally Steal This license. As always, sound effects are from Mixkit.co, used under the Mixkit royalty-free license. Segments recorded in a vehicle are recorded using a Bluetooth hands-free device. And Clerixware Ringmail assumes no liability in the consumption or distribution of the podcast. By listening, all parties agree. Any parties with questions can reach out on the Clerixware Ringmail blog. And parties who are dissatisfied can go suck an egg. Thank you for listening, everybody, and delve on.